Welcome to the Bourbon Van. I'm Phil. I'm Julie, and we're in Hood River, Oregon. Hood River, Oregon, well known for a walkable downtown full of cool shops, tons of breweries, tons of fruit orchards, beautiful scenery, windsurfing, kite surfing, and we're not here for any of that. <laughs> Today, we're visiting Clear Creek Distillery to learn more about the people behind the products. We arrived to a flurry of activity and a ton of beautiful aromas. Today we're making our apple brandy. My name is Caitlin Bartley. I'm the head distiller here at Clear Creek Distillery. Uh, I've been with the brand for 12 years uh, in two separate locations, both uh, as Clear Creek Distillery as an independent brand and then as a subsidiary of Hood River Distillers. I like asking silly questions, but have nope. you ever dropped that uh, into the vat? I, I, I absolutely <laughs> have. My name is Garrett Trotter. I am an apprentice distiller here at Clear Creek Distillery. I've been here for about seven months now. Everything comes from a local orchard or, or farmer 200 miles within a bubble around Clear Creek. And that's the rule, that's the box. It used to be 50, but we wanted to make a cranberry liqueur and cranberry only grows on the coast. So now it's 200, but it never extends beyond that. I'm Joseph O'Sullivan. I'm the master distiller for Clear Creek Distillery and Hood River Distillers. Apple brandy is really important for a number of reasons. The base spirit that we're creating today actually is what makes three different products, two Clear Creek products, a two-year aged version in limousine French oak, uh, and then an eight-year version, as well as an independent brand that's made by Clear Creek, uh, but bottled under its own name, Old Delicious. So in order to make the apple brandy, we get in 58,000 pounds of opal apples from the Yakima Valley. We do all the crushing in-house, so we have essentially a glorified blender. And so whole apples go in and applesauce comes out the other side and gets pumped into the tanks. And the only other ingredient that's added is yeast. So uh, after two weeks of being mixed once a day, uh, it goes from being super sweet uh, applesauce to boozy applesauce that smells fruity and floral and delicious of apples and rose petals and lilacs. And then we start pumping that into the stills. Uh, each still is, holds 60 gallons. They're all German Arnold Holstein pot stills, uh, which are batch stills. They're hybrid stills, so you can see that they have a column on that. And that's how we get uh, from boozy applesauce to still strength brandy in one single pass. Uh, it's because of that hybrid column. Yeah, so that's how we make apple brandy. Hood River Distillery started in 1934 as Oregon's first distillery. Now, for the first 10 or 15 years of Hood River Distillery's existence, it made apple brandy and pear brandy from the surplus fruit of the area. But going into the 1950s, that wasn't really the same financial investment as it was previously. One, we started getting cold storage, and so the surplus fruit wasn't so surplus anymore. You could sell that fruit for months at a time later on. Two, the world was kind of moving into other things. And so these finer, more um, regional brandies and whiskeys were going by the wayside in exchange for more larger volume value products. Fast forward to 1985, Steve starts Clear Creek Distillery, and he starts with making pear brandy and apple brandy the same way that Hood River Distillery started. Now that we know a little more about the history of Hood River Distillery and Clear Creek Distillers, I think it's time to try some of this apple brandy. Up next, we'll learn about the Kentucky Source Whiskey that we chose as our Oregon Bourbon of the Year for 2021. Stay tuned. Caitlin and Garrett and I, we don't have any qualms about the idea of purchasing a liquid. I mean, we've produced all of this. We've made all of this apple brandy, all of this American single malt. Everything that we make is done here. We don't have time to make a bourbon, but when we were asked to make a bourbon for the company, we wanted it to still have something interesting about it. The great thing about Trails End is I talk a lot about boxes. These are sand boxes to, to work in. There's this horrible misconception that I don't think people get any more wrong that to be creative, you need to have limitless possibilities. Uh, that's totally backwards. To be creative, you need to have a limit of possibilities and variables. Creativity is usually born from problem solving. So Clear Creek's box is this. Everything from within Clear Creek has to come from within 200 miles of the distillery. So every pear, every apple, every mirabeau plum, every blue plum, every, uh, all, all the pumice for the, for the grappa, 
uh, the Doug fir needles for the Doug fir brandy. I mean, we picked those ourselves up on Mount Hood. Now we have the new problem, which is Trails End. This whole product line, name included, is a philosophical reflection of the concept of the Oregon Trail. And this is the, just the raw concept of starting in one place, the east, ending in the northwest, and what that means. And so the liquid starts in the east, and it ends in the northwest, and that finish is the end. It was proposed to us, and I think this is the most, in, most incredible proposition. And not only that, it was the spark that ignited everything that's about to happen with this brand, which was use casks, see what it does. And there's a huge difference between what a stave does and what a cask does. Now the staves, they're submerged in the liquid and you're getting an extraction. There's a lot of char in there and that does one thing, but the using Oregon oak casks, you're getting this deeper pull. And after about a week, the casks can over oak things. So starting at day eight, we're tasting it every single day to find that harmony between that batch's blend and that fill of the Oregon oak casks. Where do we go next? Well, the next thing we do is we have all of these apple brandy barrels. So now we have these apple-fied bourbon casks that are actually the original casks that the Trails End bourbon came in. So they've been appled, and now we're putting the bourbon back in to complete this circuit from the beginning to the end to the beginning again. And that trail's now established in a new way. It finishes in the same casks that have been transformed by a Northwest apple brandy using apples from the Yakima Valley. I mean, they just come from right over the mountain range. So they're coming here. And that's actually the brandy that you saw being made earlier in the day. We're just excited where to take this next because what you're about to taste is uh, an American single malt finished one. And after that, where we want the trail to go is just further reflections of all of the culture that we have here. Oregon oak casks, a Apple brandy made by one of the oldest craft distilleries in America. A barrel that aged the first American single malt. And what else do we have in this area? We have incredible beer. We have incredible wine. We have just amazing products that we can continue to make things out of. If there was a soy sauce company in town, I would make a soy sauce <laughs> trails end finish. I honestly think that might be pretty good, by the way. The, uh, <laughs> it would be weird. It'd be very weird, but it'd be good. This is the new box that we play in for this product. It has to end in a barrel of some kind that defines the Northwest. And that way, that one variable, I don't have to make the bourbon, but I get to be creative. Now this is my kind of tasting. I love Trails End bourbon. Yeah, you do. Next up, we'll learn about one of the more unexpected and exciting whiskeys we've tasted in the last year, McCarthy's Peated Single Malt. Stick around. We're largely a winery. The single malt, the McCarthy's, is the only thing that's made from grain, and that's actually brewed by Double Mountain Brewery, which is, I don't know, five miles from here. I make McCarthy's single malt not because it's the first American single malt by everyone's current understanding, and there's a lot of research currently that's going into whether it is or not. It's been the claim that everyone's had for a long time, but to be call yourself the first, it's, it's a really interesting fact but it's not the definition of your liquid. The liquid has to speak for itself. If, if the first was bad, then no one cares. I make McCarthy's not because it's the first, but because it carries the name of the man who trained me. And he also trained Caitlin, and that's Steve McCarthy. So this is my way of keeping his influence on my life alive by uh, exposing his name to, and his legacy to other people. I'm. I see this as a, as a dire responsibility. This is something that's very important for me that I get to do. Now in a larger concept, there's a movement happening and that's American single malt. American single malt whiskey is going to get a classification within this country the way that bourbon or the way that rum or the way that vodka has. It's gonna be a designation in the United States that carries a lot of pride and a lot of honor and you can already see this happening. And it's not if, it's when this will happen. It's soon. By the time this comes out, it might already be real. And when that happens, it needs to be known that it's people at Westland and at Westward and at Triple Eight. It's people at, at Santa Fe. It's people 
at uh, Whiskey Del Bach. There's just these incredible group of distillers that have led the way into making this a real thing. And so my, my inspiration now is to keep up with these peers that I admire. Joe is like, you know, I mean, Joe's been pounding the table for, for single malts, you know, and, and Joe and Caitlin can't talk about, talk enough about Steve McCarthy. And I, I really wish I would have had like an opportunity to kind of like get to know him a little bit. You know, he's definitely off doing his own thing now. Uh, but, but coming in here and kind of like not having much of an idea of like, like American single malts and to kind of see and just kind of learn where, where it's going and how much traction it's, it's it's gaining and kind of being behind the scenes of that a little bit and like seeing like Joe, you know, being on like the board of all that stuff. Like it's really, really, really awesome. And me being someone who actually like really, really appreciates scotches and not really, not really having any kind of idea uh, of the fact that, that there was an American single malt that was, that was peated before I came here and kind of stumbling across McCarthy's in the process of kind of starting to work here. And I was like, this is, this is absolutely incredible. Single malt whiskey is at this really exciting point where the craft, the actual producers are able to craft what it's gonna look like as far as getting it ratified in the TTB as a category. Um, but the most exciting thing personally for me is the terroir that we have available to us for American single malt. I cannot wait to be able to taste what Louisiana American single malt tastes like, right? But the fact that you can be able to taste the quilted fabric of the United States throughout all of these single malt expressions are what I'm most excited for. I'm really excited to kind of see where it goes here in the next five to 10 years because I think it's going nowhere but up and uh, there's gonna be a lot more people making American single malt. Uh, so I'm just super looking forward to seeing what happens there. I, what I want for people to do, and I know this is a bourbon channel, but I want everybody to have an open mind about American single malts because I don't see this channel as just being information strictly about bourbon, it's the name alone. You guys, are excited about the spirits industry. And I think all your followers are too. Bourbon has its own history and American single malt is now. And what's really cool about American single malt, the coolest thing about it is how it's structured. It just has to be 100% barley. Right now, American single malt needs to be what people are looking at. And I, the fact that I get to say that barrel number seven is the first and that my mentor was the guy that invented it and that I get to be the one that holds all of that on his shoulders. It's, it's nothing but a mark of pride in, 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 for me. So um, to all your subscribers, if you could, go out there and try to find any bottle of American single malt you can. And if it's McCarthy's, that's great. But if you're in another part of the country and you can't find our stuff, find whatever's local. Find your, the small, regional, local, American single malt producer and buy it and try it and get excited about this because this is going to be like scotch. It's going to have terroir and it's going to have reflection of region. And we all get to shape what that's going to be like long term because we're all at the ground floor right now, both as producers, as maltsters, and consumers. Got me excited. <laughs> Well, that's it from beautiful, breezy Hood River. Obviously a lot happening at Clear Creek Distilleries and at Hood River Distillers. We are excited to see where they go to next, and I'm excited to see where we go to next. Can't wait. From wherever we are. To wherever you are. Cheers. Cheers, guys. Biggest surprise, I think, for me personally, is just the amount of like physical labor that, that is kind of involved with the everyday process. When will this be available? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm asking the important question. I grew up a farmer, and while my family's no longer in the farming business, because we're so close to the agriculture of the region, uh, I still have the same farmer stress, the stress of having to worry about fire season and whether or not we've gotten enough rain, what the diesel prices are, what grain prices are. When my parents moved, I was like, wow, I can actually, for the first time in my entire life, just like set that stress and that stuff that goes on in the background aside. And then five minutes later, I found myself being like, gosh, I really hope we don't have another heat dome because we really need cane berries this year because we could, 
We kind of sort of got away with not getting any cane berries last year, but we're gonna be hurting Mertens if we don't get cane berries this year, or if we have to go through, I mean, heaven forbid, I mean, the cherry growers have to go through a cherry season like they did last year, but like that stress hasn't left.